Well, hi, this is John Sarver, and, and welcome to our uh, My Solar Story Thursday evening Zoom. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to encourage everybody, you probably all belong to GLREA, but just in case there's one or two of you, I'd like to encourage you to uh, go to our website, glrea.org, and you can uh, join online. And I would like to thank our sponsors, the State Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, EGLE, uh, Homeland Solar, McNaught and McKay, Iron Ridge Racking, Harvest Solar, and Shri Energy. And tonight we have, a, uh, I think, a very interesting topic. I keep hearing questions about, what about recycling? What, what are we going to do with all those solar panels? And uh, Nick, who's a... Uh, uh, an associate professor of uh, civil and environmental engineering at Michigan State University has been kind of involved in this area and other areas related to renewable energy. She may want to share uh, some of those uh, when I kind of pass the torch to her here. But um, I think uh, this is good information because people keep raising the issue. And I can tell from just reading, uh, it's not like uh, there isn't uh, work to be done, but I think there has been a lot of progress. So, uh, uh, Annette, go ahead, uh, kind of give us the story. Well, thanks for the introduction. So, um, yeah, to start that uh, correctly. So, yeah, so today I've been asked to talk a bit more about uh, solar end of life. So, this is, uh, I'm gonna talk about recycling, but I think before we talk about recycling, we need to understand a bit more what is solar panels and some of the challenge with both like reusing and recycling solar panels. So uh, yeah, I'm an associate professor in civil environmental engineering at uh, Michigan State University. I've been there for almost uh, 10 years, gonna be 10 years in August. Uh, I'm also in ag bio research, uh, which is the agricultural school. So that was a, that's a recent appointment, but that, that's mostly because I do some work on solar and farming and the impact on my crops. That's not what I'm going to talk about today, but that's a, another aspect of, of my research. I'm also the assistant director for the Michigan Industrial Assessment Center. So a big part of my research is also to go uh, and look into manufacturing, in particularly for like how do we manufacture and recycle solar panels and all the materials aspect of uh, solar panels. So a little bit more about me. So my background, I'm a material engineer. So I really like to look at uh, like, where is the material coming from? How do we transform it? And like, how do we make solar panels? Because uh, it, it requires really high purity materials. So this is kind of my specialty is high purity materials and the environmental impact of making those. Um, I did get my PhD in sustainability. I started, I was going to be like a micro electronic engineer. So I was good at making um, like cells and so on. But I realized I was more interested in like the broader aspect of sustainability. So uh, like what materials we were using and what we're going to do at, at the end of life. So I switched program after one year, uh, which is not usual. You do all your exam and then you're on your way of getting your PhD. And I decided, well, that's not really the PhD I wanted to do. So I switched and got a PhD in sustainability from um, RIT in New York. Uh, and I worked at the UN for a little bit, trying to figure out like what I was interested in doing. And I did work on life cycle assessment over there and how uh, we can use that for uh, manufacturing. After that, I was a postdoc at Brookhaven National Lab and uh, my project was mostly related to First Solar, which is a really big manufacturer, not really far from Michigan, just in Ohio. So they do cadmium telluride solar panels. So I work on their recycling process and uh, the, uh, the impact of mining materials for solar panels. Um, I was a faculty at Clemson University for two years, and I started doing a lot of work on like kind of life of solar panels back then. So I did a lot of work uh, looking at what would impact, what would be the impact of putting solar panels and other electronic waste uh, in landfill. So in the landfill, we add over there like it. I'm not sure. I think there's still like solar panels leaching. <laughs> like we're, it's a long duration project when we do landfill studies. So we did that for a pretty long time, and I've moved to Michigan State in 2014. So other things that I've been involved on, I uh, mentioned it now because we're going to switch more to like recycling and solar panels, but I do a lot of work, uh, as uh, John mentioned, I, I work on other types of energy too, not just solar. I've done a lot of work on battery and second life batteries for Ford for the last 10 years. So also known for that and have that project on the wind turbines. I do a lot of work on like 
material for pavement and recycling in general, but solar is what I love the most. So I'm always happy <laughs> to be able to talk about it. I've been working in solar for 15 years. So it's, it's a lot of years for uh, this kind of industry uh, now. So uh, some of the thing I've done in solar also is related to, um, I'm gonna try to do the laser pointer thing. Uh, I've worked on different standards. So there is like a NSF standard that is related to sustainability that dictates like what you should put or not put in a solar panel. So uh, I was part of that and the follow up criteria that was just released, which is about like ultra low carbon for solar panels. So I was the technical expert for that. So that's something I pretty well known uh, for is like, how do you calculate what is the carbon footprint of making solar panels and using recycled materials as part of making new uh, module is a big part of that. So um, yeah, and I do a lot for like women in engineering and women in energy in general, because I think that's important to have more uh, representation. So in general, what my research is about is uh, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm gonna try to get rid of that, uh, is to address general public concern. So that's why also I like to do those kind of discussion with all people that are interested in renewables, but also that bring me new questions that I like to answer or other things that they've heard in uh, public hearings or uh, in other places because I cannot be everywhere. <laughs> but uh, like the kind of question I've been working on is for example, like, well, is there like PFAS in solar panels? Will that leach in the ground and so on? Uh, recently, there's been more and more uh, concerns from, uh, there's a lot of new manufacturing coming to the U.S. as part of the uh, new funding opportunity. So, and there's been like raising concerns for some of the manufacturing location about like the toxicity or the impact of the manufacturing. So I've been answering a lot of questions about that or concerns about like even like the noise or uh, waste, which is more what we're going to talk about today. So um, in terms of what is my expertise is life cycle assessment. So as I said, I look at where is the material coming from? How do we transform it into uh, semiconductor? So this is mostly for uh, silicon. How do we make solar cells? Uh, what is the benefit of using solar panels during their full uh, use phase and then end of life, whether we're disposing of it or if we're able to recycle it back into, the, into a new solar module. So, in general, what the kind of work I do is called like prospective LCA. So I'm trying to evaluate what is the impact of the technology and reduce uh, unintended consequence. So we see, I don't necessarily work a lot on like solar modules that are already uh, commercialized. Like I'm looking in like five years or what's going to be the impact in like 10 years of like the new technology, new uh, solar module technology with like the existing uh, modules and uh, retirement and so on. So I'm not, I'm not, I do work a little bit on like current thing, but I'm looking in the future to try to uh, minimize problem in the future. So, and why we, I do that, but because, well, and that's why I'm an environmental engineer is because I really want to reduce the impact on human and the environment. So I think right now, as we develop solar technology, uh, it's a good time to like if we can change some of the chemicals to make it safer. So we don't want to work with toxic chemicals and maybe, yeah, we're making a solar panel that is good for the environment, but there are ways of making it even better if we're not exposing people to like toxic chemicals during its production. Um, we don't want to be responsible for a conflict or illegal mining. So this is becoming an issue for silicon with some of the region where uh, the quartz was being um, extracted or transformed into like polysilicon. So we also interrelate the waste. We don't want to create a new electronic waste problem because with the volume of waste that will come from solar panels uh, in the future, that could be not as much as electronic waste, but it's a it would be a pretty large amount of, uh, of material or we just don't want in general to create any new problem. So uh, again, my goal is to reduce the environmental impact of energy and technology. Uh, and I like to address general and public concerns. So, what we try to do with sustainability is it's kind of a moving target. Like what we think is sustainable right now, it's not the same thing as what it was going to be like in five years. Like if we develop new methods for making it cheaper, like uh, like the goal in terms of minimizing the environmental, economic or social aspect change over time. But some of the aspects we need to consider are all of those things around here. And for a long time for solar, the only thing we heard about was, well, what is the cost of the technology and what is the environmental impact compared to other ones? So yeah, like solar panels produce a lot less uh, CO2 per kilowatt hours. This is 
pretty obvious. Um, now they are pretty cheap compared to other technology, but we need to make sure that uh, all of all of those and even more other aspects are considered in the future to make the technology sustainable. So um, I just talked about like the carbon footprint. So this is kind of the range what is accepted in terms of like a carbon emission. So coal, depending on like where it's from and the kind of turbine you have to go between like 675 and 1,689. Natural gas is a bit lower, but by comparison, uh, solar can be between like 18 and 180 gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So there's a range because obviously if you're making solar from solar energy, you can make that even uh, better for the environment. So even in the worst case scenario, solar is always better than other type of energy in terms of uh, carbon footprint. Um, that's also uh, like the price for a long time was a big concern for solar. So people were, will always say, well, like solar is way too expensive. It's never gonna compete with other uh, technology, but uh, we've shown with uh, the total installation. And I don't know, last week at the conference I was in, uh, there was even more recent value that showed that this uh, those number have decreased again like quite a bit in the last year or two because of the massive installation we've had uh, globally. So uh, there's been a really de rapid decrease in the PV cost since 2010. And uh, for as I said before, like I've been in this industry for 15 years, first as making trying to make the best solar cells, and everybody in my group was doing um, like efficiency was always the thing we were targeting and making things cheaper. But now modules is not the most expensive part of the system. So we've been really good at decreasing like how much materials we're using, how much energy is being used and so on. So like the the, the cost reduction has been really, really important. What is uh, remains pretty expensive now is what we call like the soft cost or, um, well, mostly the soft cost, cost, which is like this gray part. And this is, a lot of it is just how much time it takes to get a project going or like all the other costs you have to put in a project that are not directly related to like the system itself. So, and the kind of work I do is trying also to reduce those soft costs because if you have less opposition to a project, uh, you can move a project faster. You also don't need necessarily to put as much money aside uh, for planning for end of life or for recycling and so on. So fully um, like, answering a lot of those uh, worries or concerns about solar could help reduce the soft cost of uh, solar in the long term. So uh, in general, if you're not familiar with um, uh, the PVPS, so the IEA as a photovoltaic power system program, uh, and this is, I would say, the best source of information for everything that has to do with solar, like globally. And uh, there's different tasks, like task 12 is the sustainability activities. And uh, well, and there's always like a lot of different, um, they call them like cooperating agents and then they are representative from different country. So uh, the, the main operator for that uh, activity is carbon heat from the National Renewable Energy Labs, who's been in charge of that for a long time. So, um, and the kind of thing they publish, they publish a lot about life cycle assessment, like resource, but also uh, more and more now, there's been a lot of uh, effort towards like uh, recycling and understanding like how recycling is done in different country and uh, in particular uh, in the US. So there's a lot of reports that are published uh, pretty often, way more often now as like sustainability is becoming a, a big area of, um, of solar uh, as it's getting bigger and so on. So, uh, that's some, that's some of the report I like to read to know kind of what is the status of research on those areas. So how much solar has been installed so far? Quite a bit. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, solar uh, to be able to calculate how much we're gonna end up at end of life. We uh, need to have a good idea of like how much has been installed globally. Uh, but if we look uh, where it's been installed, um, like recently we've been installing quite a bit uh, in the US, so the US would be uh, the blue thing. And again, this is some of the report from the PVPS. Uh, task one, provide general data about what is going on globally. Uh, but by far, like China is uh, the largest amount of capacity. This is 2022. The 2023 report was published last week, so I didn't have time to update that, my, my slide this last week. But uh, like the US has about like 12%, so it's not the smallest one, but it's not... Um, the largest amount, but mostly what has been installed is more recent in other countries. So we can expect that our retirement will be a little bit later. 
compared to other countries. So if we're looking in the future though, uh, like the US is supposed to uh, continue installing, but at a much slower rate than uh, other regions. So in mostly like China and Asia or the largest installer, and this is even like with newer um, estimations, but compared to what we've installed in the past, this is still uh, increasing pretty quickly. So uh, in the US, the one thing that is different than in Europe, um, and we're gonna talk about, uh, like there's always a comparison in terms of like end of life management with Europe, because that's where there is the most policy for, for management compared uh, to the US. But all the solar installations are in Europe is really different in the US. So most of their, uh, they have a much higher proportion of uh, residential or commercial versus utility. Um, and, it, and some country even don't necessarily have a lot of utility because there's more restriction about like large scale plants and so on. So that also changed like your management of end of life uh, solar panels. Um, in Michigan, and I think at the beginning of the discussion, you mentioned that there's a lot of question and people started talking about end of life in Michigan and like solar in Michigan is really new. So, uh, but it is growing much faster than a lot of uh, other region. So like now, if you look at those uh, kind of map about like where is like solar growing and where there is the most potential for solar, like Michigan is one of the state that is now identified because of like the, all the recent change in policy that is making Michigan way more attractive for solar, but also because the price of electricity is pretty expensive. So with this really rapid uh, reduction in cost now, solar makes a lot more sense than it did 10 years ago. So, um, and this is uh, kind of what happened in the last uh, 10 years. So as I said before, there was pretty much uh, no solar in 2014, and I like to say, well, this is when I moved. So everybody was uh, curious as why I was moving to, I was in South Carolina where there was good solar potential, also not a huge amount of like solar array because of policy reason. And everybody, when I was there was even like the utility were telling me that, well, we have a lot of solar, but if you want solar, go to North Carolina. In South Carolina, we do nuclear. But um, when I moved to Michigan, there was like no large array. Uh, and then Michigan State started talking about like doing like the solar carport and everything. But it grew really, really quickly. Uh, in part through um, like in the last four years, there's been a gigantic uh, growth in the capacity of solar install. Uh, we do have quite a bit of residential that is growing, but the utility, for, of course, is the uh, really fast growing um, component, but it is also very recent compared to other states. So if you compare with uh, California, uh, who has about like 10 years more of experience installing solar, um, that's where like a lot of the waste is expected to come from. So, uh, but again, like we're expected to grow faster in a lot of other states. Um, so we should start thinking about like end of life and how to manage any uh, waste from solar now in particular when we're installing really large solar array um, like that, like we're doing in Michigan, there's a higher chance of having multiple modules that are broken during installation or during transportation and so on. So we need to have a solution uh, for, for, for solar panels already. So what exactly are the solar uh, modules where we're installing. So um, I mentioned before I did some work with First Solar in the past. So this is data uh, globally. It's not just for, for the US. The share of like First Solar is much higher in the US compared to other countries since they are like a local uh, product, but they are a small portion of the overall uh, global technology. So um, most of the solar panels are made of uh, either like uh, crystalline silicon or polycrystalline or, um, but they are both like silicon type of solar panels. And now um, there's pretty much no more polycrystalline being produced. If we look at what is gonna be produced in the US with new factory, for example, everything is monocrystalline and even like the next generation of solar panels. Uh, so uh, the technology itself is changing pretty quickly and efficiency has uh, grown quite a bit, but also we can see how much uh, the production has uh, grown exponentially in the last uh, six years. So uh, when we're talking about like recycling, the type of modules matter, like the, this is really different in terms of uh, material than silicon, and that might look like a small amount of waste, but 
most of those modules are in UI, so it, it ends up being quite a bit of a quantity of modules. So uh, the main difference between the two type of modules is, I'll start with the CAD tail. So the Cayman Pyrite is mostly a glass on glass modules. And then uh, I'll use the active layer, the Cayman Pyrite is being evaporated on the surface. So you don't have cells like you see in the silicon modules because uh, the materials is evaporated. And then how we like define the, the cells and the, uh, the individual things is through like laser or uh, different patterning uh, with the isolation and so on. So it is not, there's no like growth of silicon uh, cells like we see in this figure. It's a pretty different technology. It is important for recycling because like you don't have the cell, uh, you just can leach the, the material at end of life. You don't need to worry about like the crystalline part of that. So uh, this is like the old technology, the cat tail modules, the recent one are a bit different than that. Now there's like a, a steel frame to it um, that wasn't there in previous generation, what is installed, uh, but they just started producing those. So uh, this is still like more relevant in terms of like what is in the field right now. For a silicon, uh, you can have both. You can have modules that are similar to cat tail where you have like glass on glass and the double glass modules are becoming more common in particular in the US because of that's not what we need for like bifacial modules. So modules that will absorb light from both sides. Um, and they were more popular for the US because of policy reason, because they were not part of the, like the, the tariff uh, on China modules uh, didn't include the bifacial. But in terms of material, like what you have is pretty much like the cells here, which is what produce the electricity. Um, or place in between two layers of in, like an encapsulant and then you have the glass on the top and either like a glass on the back or a, a back sheet which is made of plastic um, and then both of them like have a junction box. Most silicon modules have frame but there's again like some technology now that are uh, becoming frameless because that's a way of getting rid of some of the price with the uh, aluminum frame. But if you look the important part about that is uh, in terms of recycling what matters is the value of the material, but when you have a solar modules, most of the material is not very valuable. Uh, so it's mostly glass. And uh, if you have like a aluminum frame, that's like you're, you, you can get to like 95% by weight uh, with just these two materials. But the really valuable materials is a really small amount. So usually you have like 0.1% of silver in a silicon module and you have silicon and silicon is valuable, but it is valuable as a cell, like a working cell. The silicon itself is not very valuable if it's broken and so on. So uh, we end up with uh, quite heavy modules that have low um, economic value at end of life. For the CAD module, CAD tail modules, uh, again, it's mostly glass, mostly because it's glass on glass and the cadmium material, again, it's a really small amount there, but the theorem is pretty valuable. So if you're able to extract it, then uh, that's good. You can make money from it. And that's what uh, First Solar is doing because um, uh, theorem is actually pretty scarce. So that's always been part of their um, way of ensuring that they will survive. And so if you're making solar panels from a scarce material, you want to recycle uh, your modules at the end of life. Otherwise you're not going to have anything to make new modules in the future. So uh, First Order developed their recycling process as they were developing the technology. So they've always had like recycling facility on their production plan. So because right now, well, now it might change a little bit, but originally most of the recycled material was coming from production. So, and right now First Order is building two new facilities in the US, um, one in Louisiana and one in Georgia, I think. Uh, and they are building a recycling facility as they are building manufacturing. So they always have like a recycling plant with their manufacturing. So I'm not gonna talk a lot more about free solar, but I can if there is any question, but uh, they've, uh, I just said that already, but they, they've always recycle and make sure that the what they produce at the end is kind of this, uh, they can leach uh, with different acid the material and they send it back to like the reprocessor that makes more CAD tail, send it back to them and then they can make, they can make new uh, modules with it. The other thing about the CAD tail is uh, with the technology improvement, they've been able to increase how much efficiency they get per module by using less material. So that means that if they get a material like a solar module that is about like 10 years old, they can actually make now two modules 
from one module. Uh, from like one old module, they can make two newer modules in terms of material that are higher efficiency. So for them, it's that it's a good idea to recycle because they can make more money by recycling than leaving those modules in the field. So uh, just similar to the previous figure, it just gives you a little bit more details about like the kind of material you have there and like what gets recycled or not recycled and where there is some concerns. Uh, so one of the concerns about uh, solar panel, mostly silicon one is the lead, which is used in the, like in the string ribbons or in the solder, uh, like more elect most electronics uh, product, the rest of the materials are not uh, very uh, special material. There is some concern about some uh, back sheet that could uh, be from, uh, that are fluorinated uh, product but it doesn't mean they, they leach any uh, PFAS or anything. It's just like that's uh, the same category of material, but not necessarily toxic and so on. So why do solar modules reach end of life? So why do we need to start thinking about end of life if we just started installing solar panels in Michigan? So in theory, like the warranty on solar modules is historically was towards like 25 years. Now it's moving toward 30 and then uh, they're trying to go towards like 40 years old uh, modules. But uh, how long they will really, um, like how long they can really last in the environment really depends on like their environment. So uh, it's a little bit strange to say, but solar modules don't really like sun <laughs> that much. So if you have too much sun or a change in temperature, moisture, and like mechanical load, then it gets a little bit harder for them to resist. So usually we put all this material because you really don't want, uh, we, you don't want light with humidity in your solar modules because like everything else, there's gonna be like the same kind of like rust or other degradation uh, process happening. And that's one of the main uh, things that will uh, lead to failure. So there's a lot of different kind of de uh, degradation mode that happen um, and I'm not gonna, read all of that, but like, even if you, they are supposed to last 25 or 30 years, um, they, they don't always do. There's also uh, people would think like we've been making solar panels for a long time, we're getting better at it and there's gonna be less and less defect, but that's not true because a big part of innovation is changing how we're making those modules. So we keep changing like the design of the cells or like the different layers or um, the different materials. And a lot of time we're creating new defects with innovation that we cannot anticipate until we do accelerated testing. So the good thing is there's like Duramat is a big group at NREL that that's all they do. They do like reliability testing. So they, um, they test modules and new technology to see if there is uh, new concerns emerging. So one of the emerging concerns with solar panels right now and durability is uh, we keep making solar panels bigger and bigger. And a big module is not really good for many, uh, mechanical uh, load or stress. So in particular, like in Michigan, when it's really windy, if you have a module that is too big, there's more chance of uh, breaking it or starting like flying and so on. So uh, there are some design change that is making um, like the, like the life of the module shorter than what you would anticipate. And finally, there's economic reason. Um, so because technology has changed so much in the last 10 years, um, they've become cheaper, but more efficient. So even though we were maybe thinking about keeping them for 25, 30 years originally, now if you can use the same space and replace the modules with uh, modules that are twice the efficiency of what you installed 10 years ago, uh, you might may make more money. So, uh, and we call that in general, like for economic repowering. Um, and th there's more and more of that happening. Uh, and it's not as discussed uh, because usually if you're uh, like a large producer, you don't want to advertise that you've replaced modules that were still good, uh, but it is happening. And that's a reason why uh, reuse and recycling of solar panels is happening sooner than we anticipated because there is more uh, repowering because of economic reasons and rapid improvement in solar technologies. So in terms of uh, how much waste there is supposed to be, uh, so we said before like China is the largest installer, so of course they're gonna be uh, the most uh, waste. Here I have like two type of projections, so what we call like regular loss, so this is like, if we just assume you install a panel and then 25 years later, you remove it. So that's kind of the best case scenario. 
Uh, the other one, the early loss, then um, account for some uh, degradation, failure, and some rebarring. So you can see there's a pretty big gap in between if you just assume like the best case scenario and what is most likely uh, to happen. And even like this um, analysis is a bit old now, and the number would be a lot higher than that because the price of modules have decreased much faster than what was anticipated. So uh, there's even more repowering happening than what we originally thought. So this is uh, like the recent paper we just published, uh, Michael, Zuck, Pretty, and I are looking specifically for the US. So we haven't really installed anything um, before like 2010. So most of the waste is um, happening kind of later. We also kind of broke it down about like what states um, this is gonna happen first. Uh, so not really any surprise, California is the first one. Texas has installed like solar really quickly, but also is one of the states where there's the most repowering happening. Uh, because of, for, for a lot of different reasons, I'm not going to go into it, um, but uh, there's more repowering there than other places. And as you can see, Michigan is not there because we're still uh, behind in terms of like large scale um, installation. So it would happen a little bit later than other places. This also kind of show like the amount of material you have, but it's not really surprising. Like a solar panel is mostly glass and aluminum. Um, and still this is because we included uh, the frame and, and so while well, the structure of the solar system so but in terms of material like the valuable materials is a really small amount versus uh, like the common materials so in terms of like what kind of waste we uh, pv waste regulation we have in the us uh, i would say pretty much every state is talking about it but not a lot of states have done something uh, concrete um so most of the regulation like the most not important one, but uh, California has kind of changed what kind of category uh, solar panels are considered. So they're not considered hazardous anymore. So they are universal waste. So if they don't, they pass like the CCLP test, they, there's no problem in like line filling it. One of the most different uh, regulation is in Washington state because they put a, um, a regulation that made the installer uh, like the producer of the solar module responsible for the end of life. So they need to plan, like when you buy a module, there's, uh, well, usually there's an extra cost because the installer put back that cost to like the uh, the person buying it. But there is uh, there is money set aside uh, to ensure that the producer will collect and handle the post customer PV module. And the other regulation uh, depend in other states, but, uh, they are not, uh, there's no federal regulation. So this is pretty different than uh, other place. Uh, in Europe, uh, PV Cycle is the organization kind of in charge of the recycling scheme. And in um, in European Union, it's always been required to uh, recycle solar panels. So when, since, <laughs> well, I don't know since when, but at least since 2010. So for a long time, it's been there and it's required. So you cannot just uh, landfill it, you need to, um, make sure you're trying to recycle it. And it has impacted a lot the kind of research and work as that has been done because if there is a re requirement for recycling, then a lot more people work on that problem than uh, we do in the US because there was no really any regulation uh, for that. So in terms of like circular economy, uh, I know like I'm supposed to talk more about recycling, but there's a lot of other things we're supposed to do to uh, reduce the impact of solar modules. So the first thing is to um, design solar modules that uh, would reduce the use of materials and then uh, like during the manufacturing and so on. The other part that is uh, important too, and um, we have some people here working in that area is also, and in Michigan, there's some effort in that area is to before sending solar modules that are still working is to reuse them, uh, repurpose them. Uh, and that's an area that has not been developed a lot in the US right now, and um, there's still a lot of opportunities to uh, increase uh, the amount of uh, reuse of solar panels. And I'll talk more about that um, in a few minutes and give some example about that. And then uh, obviously you wanna re like recycle it and return some of the materials. In this figure, it shows as if it's going back to the same industry, but it doesn't need to be a closed loop. It's just, uh, you wanna make sure the materials doesn't end up as waste. So in order to have like circular economy though, you need to have modules that uh, would be designed for that. So you cannot repair solar modules if they are not designed for it. Uh, and also uh, it is difficult for solar modules to make them recyclable because uh, if you're 
it goes kind of against the goal you have. If you're trying to make a solar module that's going to last 40 years, usually you use materials that uh, are really good, like really good glue or a lot more materials. You make it really resistant to the environment. And those properties usually don't make it really easy to disassemble or break down. So um, so that's, that's kind of a, the problem there. And then uh, we try to minimize the amount of waste that is uh, being produced. So for PV, there's a lot of drivers for doing circular economy. So uh, obviously um, that's another industry. So that would be good if we uh, have either like reuse and recycling, that would be a, a new market, creating a new job. Uh, it's also good for like supply chain stability. So uh, like right now, we're trying to get more solar manufacturing in the US. Uh, one of the components, silver, everybody is, uh, I've been I've been talking about making solar panels with no silver for at least ten years, but the actual future technology is going to use more silver than current technology. So we're not going that direction. Uh, and for for the US in particular, we're not really producing. We well, we do produce primary silver, but uh, end of life solar modules could become uh, the main source of silver for uh, for manufacturing solar panels in the US. So it's kind of a making sure we have supply for future manufacturing uh, would be through like circular economy and recycling. Um, also, there's this benefit if you don't have to always import all those resources, you're able to you take the solar panels, you recycle it, then you return it into uh, new modules. That's a good thing. The barriers is, uh, well, there's not a, a lot of like repair and reuse option. It's, um, as I said before, I did work a lot on second life batteries and it is similar, but also really different to work on batteries because uh, like when you have a battery at end of life, you have one big module and uh, you can test it and then you reuse it in other application. It's really different for like solar panels because you end up with a really large farm and a lot of individual modules and it's not really easy right now. Well, there's more methods. A lot of people are working into trying to test uh, solar panels without, uh, with different techniques that would allow not like, individual uh, testing, but like large scale testing and you can screen which ones are good or not. But otherwise you end up with a lot of individual units with not that much uh, value. And also like transporting solar panels um, after their first life, uh, they're pretty heavy. So you, you wouldn't wanna like transport them over a long distance uh, if this is gonna end up being more expensive than the price of the module itself or something like that. So um, the other uh, issue is that the price of solar modules have decreased so much. It's a good thing for like new installation, but solar modules are pretty cheap right now, like the new ones. So uh, it's really difficult to make the second life modules competitive with that really low price point. In particular, if you cannot offer the same warranty, then um, there's going to be some niche application or uh, certain yeah certain application will make sense, but uh, it is more difficult uh, for for that market. Um, another thing, this is just some work uh, about repowering because I mentioned it before, and that's also, well, that's some work we're doing right now uh, from one of my students, but uh, like we're trying to look at like where are like repowering happening. So as I said before, it can be for different reasons uh, because, uh, and one of them is just the extreme uh, weather events. So uh, this is looking at like what uh, the same map in 2016 and 2020. So uh, the green would be like the new installation, the one that are not replaced are yellow, um, the one that we think are possible replacements are blue, but the one that we're pretty sure has, have been replaced are all those uh, red dots you can see here. So, um, and what you can uh, maybe, it's a bit hard to see, but even like in Michigan, there are some red or uh, in like Minnesota and some of those regions. So. Um, and in Florida, quite a bit, of, they're more or less on, uh, each on top of each other. But all of those places are places where there's a lot of chance of like extreme events. Um, so if you have like tornado, high wind and hail, for example, um, that's kind of these three maps here. Those are all regions that are more likely to have uh, replacement because of those uh, kind of uh, weather events. So you can see that for uh, Michigan, uh, we have pretty high wind, so there's been quite a bit of damage because of wind. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of hail um, issues. I'm not sure why this is not in green, but um, 
the point is the Midwest has more of those events than a lot of like the three different events than the other region. So in terms of planning for repowering, uh, we might want to think about it earlier than later because we might have more of those large scale uh, solar farms that are touched by um, by those things. Uh, yeah, and this analysis too, I didn't put it there, but um, we're looking also at each location, like what is the usually the, how the payment or how the so like the utility are paying or like the kind of the cost structure in each places uh, and figure out like why there is uh, repowering or not based on economic reason, based on when the solar modules were uh, installed. So um, I mentioned before, like there are some company working on second life batteries, at, uh, not batteries, solar. And I'm not, I'm just gonna discuss too, there's more than two, but it, it is not like a, a really large market right now. Um, and the one of the, one that has been there for a bit longer is uh, called Equitable Solar Solution. And they started mostly, uh, it's not for a profit, like usually they retire solar modules and then they, uh, they use that then mostly for like community solar and uh, in low income community. So they operate uh, in Colorado. Um, now it says like in New Mexico, but they are mostly in Colorado. Um, and what is also, what is acting really great with them is they, they are developing methods for testing. Uh, so like a different protocol and new standards for testing modules at, um, uh, at not at end of life, but that are being retired because they wanna make sure that they are not installing something that would be not safe uh, in a low income community in particular. So um, so the, if they will only install, uh, like for example, on a house module that will qualify as like what they call like tier one. Uh, and this is something that they are pretty confident that it will last for 20 years. So it is a really good uh, working modules and so on. If there is some, um, like small defects and doesn't test perfectly automatically, that uh, module is not used uh, as a new module. It is used what they call like a restricted use. Uh, so it would be like in a off, well, like not on the on the roof, it would be like a separate system. So if there is a fire or something, uh, it wouldn't like not destruct another structure and so on. And finally, like the third one is anything that doesn't meet like the data sheet or there is concern about some of the safety issue of the module, then automatically get uh, disposed or recycled. So I think what is interesting with that company is that they provided some data about the modules they're getting uh, and like the modules they're getting are not like 20 years old. So the average has, has been in service for 11.75 years. So uh, this is pretty far from like the 25 years um, and they've had some that were only there for like a year or two. So some, uh, it, it's a pretty good idea that uh, there are places for a different reason that they decide to remove the solar panels. So there are some modules that uh, reach end of life that are still working and can and should be reused if they have good performance rather than being recycled. Um, another company, uh, this one is a bit different, but uh, it's called like Sparta. Uh, it's part of Antilly and that's their uh, Sparta facility. So um, this is a, com a company that started from uh, a car industry. So it is similar model in terms of uh, like the car industry does a lot of uh, repurposing or repair of uh, components. So what they do is they, um, like a lot of the module, they, they test, they have a big facility. They actually like take all the modules, they bring them to their facility, they test them. If there is like small minor uh, repair that can be done, they, they do it. So they, particularly like on the connectors, that's what this is showing here, or some um, cables and so on, they would repair it and then they resell the modules. So it is different than the other example because the um, equitable solar solution, they mostly focus on uh, like solar modules that were installed like on your roof on your or mostly on commercial buildings, for example, and then uh, or um, like replace after a certain amount, uh, amount of time. Um, this company is different because most of the panels they get are uh, due to like insurance claim. A lot of them are from uh, like truck incidents or damaged solar panels after a storm. So what happens right now, like the all the utility uh, insurance work is if you have, even like if you have a large, real large, like a 200 megawatt solar farm and only like one or two roads are broken, the insurance company sometimes will ask you to like, 
uh, a full claim for the full site. So you have to replace all the solar modules, even the one that were not necessarily damaged by the storm. So because of that, you end up with a lot of modules that are not used, they're not damaged, but just for insurance reason get uh, removed and replaced. So, um, and the one, for example, in a truck incident or just in delivery, so it's more like the packaging and so on, they are not, uh, a lot of them have never been like connected or not connected to um, like utility for a really long time. So, so this is not necessarily a huge market, but it is a huge market as we're installing solar modules and we have more solar modules on the road and so on. So it can be a larger um, amount. So they've been uh, doing it for like a few years now, but they are growing pretty quickly um, because of, of all those insurance claims on like large scale uh, solar farm. So going back to like the recycling potential, uh, so if you want to be a recycler, what should you jump into um, that market or not? So this is just the kind of the same uh, figure in terms of like if you convert the amount of material you have versus like what is the value of what you have. So um, like most of the value would be, well, like per kilogram, like the value is in the silver, but that's not what you have uh, the most in, in terms of material. So in theory, the glass should have the, the most value, but it is it's difficult right now to get the solar glass uh, into a new market. It's mostly down cycle, but uh, there's a lot of effort uh, trying to get that um, better. The other concern is um, like, it's good to calculate what is the value of solar modules, but that's also like one of the reasons solar modules are cheaper now is because we reduce how much material we're using. So this is looking at like how much we're using over time. So we're using like more and more glass, less aluminum, uh, less silicon or less uh, the silver, as I said, well, that's the little red line here. It's growing back, but uh, like everything that is valuable, we're trying to reduce the amount and replace that by, um, non-valuable material. So the decrease in dollar per kilogram uh, uh, over time makes it harder to uh, to make like a business case for, for solar recycling. So how does recycling look like in the US? So in this slide, I say that about like 10% of modules are recycled in the US. So the good news, I talked with someone from April last week, well, no, this week. And she said, she really thinks this number is uh, wrong. This is a bit more than that, but it's not like 100%. It's more like 15, 15 to 20% of modules are being recycled. And the reason for that, um, John said at the beginning, like this is an area that is changing really quickly. So if I talk about this now, and if I present again, like next year, it's going to be completely different. Like the industry is changing really, really fast. Uh, and there is a desire for, for recycling. Uh, and it comes from both the well, the federal government and the requirement for um, for U.S. content, for example, you can only do that if we use recycled materials from solar panels, so to speak, uh, and also by by installer or the general public that want to make sure that the solar panels get uh, recycled. But right now, there's really there's inconsistency. There's no federal regulation, and each state is pretty different. Uh, most states don't have any regulation at all. Um, it is pretty expensive to landfill uh, to recycle versus how much it is to landfill. So the cost is about fifteen to forty five dollar per module to recycle, and it's less than one dollar for landfilling. So we need also to find a better way of recycling it, cutting the cost of the recycling, and having a good market for the recycle materials there. So SIA um, has a list, which is the Solar Energy Industry Association, as the list of recycling partners, uh, and like the one I talked about. Uh, until you is there, uh, but it's not like advertising. They just say, well, those are the company that uh, that are better or more known in terms of like recycling partners, but it doesn't mean that they, they return all the materials to do something. Most of the recycling um, recyclers, they take the glass and the frame because that's what you have the most in terms of mass, but the active layer is not uh, automatically recycled. I would say in most of the case, it's not recycled there. So that's just the overall um, structure of it. So what people do with it, uh, a lot of time, like the glass in particular is used in um, like in fiberglass, for example, or uh, in just as uh, in, in road material or just as filler and so on. So it's really down cycling. It's not recycling back into um, new, new solar glass and so on. 
So uh, for some of the other component, um, as you said that, like usually the glass goes into fiberglass or other kind of glass materials. The polymer gets uh, landfilled or incinerated. Uh, the metals, that's what is actually really recyclable. And we'll see the aluminum frame is really easy to get. Um, and then the junction box goes with like the e-waste recyclers and the cable as well. So that's the main thing that are uh, being recycled would be like this one. This one is uh, mostly down cycle and this ends up um, landfilled. So in theory, you would want like the silicon to go back to new modules, but it is very difficult um, because most of the silicon value is in the electricity used for making it. So uh, if we, um, it's not really being uh, recycled there. One of the big thing that has happened in the US uh, this year is um, the launch of like solar cycle. Um, solar cycle claim to be uh, able to recycle most of the material in a solar panel. So in particular, they just announced uh, in February that they were gonna do uh, solar glass for uh, from solar panels. So that's a pretty big announcement. They haven't started, and they're not supposed to get production until like the end of 2025, but that would be a major change in uh, recycling in the US because um, we actually don't do any uh, rolled glass, which is what is used for like silicon modules in the US at all. So like this solar cycle would not only uh, recycle glass from solar modules, it would also become the first producer of uh, solar glass for solar modules in the US. So in terms of like supply chain, that's a pretty important uh, step uh, towards more circular economy. So why are we not recycling um, like the silicon back? Uh, it's mostly because the starting material is like $2 per kilogram. So it is cheaper um, and we have a lot of, this is like how much high quality sand and what is the cost of producing um, MG silicon in US. So it's pretty cheap. So it's really hard to get the silicon back into silicon. So one of the things though, um, that recycler or pursuing instead of uh, returning silicon into silicon, and that's not my picture, this is from a paper there, but is to put it back into uh, like I, um, technology applications. So in particular, one of the applications that is emerging is for uh, electric vehicle batteries. So uh, in lithium ion battery, you use mostly graphite, but you could use um, uh, silicon uh, base uh, to, to replace the graphite in, in batteries. So, and that's a really, it, this is like moving much faster than uh, anticipated. So, uh, so the silicon from PV waste is high purity and good enough purity for that application. So that would replace the graphite in, um, in battery material. So, um, so EPRI uh, is doing a lot of work right now uh, with uh, Recycler and like doing interview and understanding like what are the challenge and what people are doing. It is a challenging area uh, to do research because um, like we can identify a lot of recyclers, but most of the recyclers or um, like regular recycler that mostly dismantle like the frame, the glass and so on, and then send the materials to other uh, producers. So it's hard to track what really happens with most of the material and how much gets recycled uh, versus dump cycle and, and the flow of it. So that's what this group is trying to do. And we work with them um, trying to understand a bit more like what is happening and where is their need for, um, for more uh, research and infrastructure. So uh, how can we get more PV, uh, second life recycling. So I said before, a uh, big part of what I do is uh, standard and label. So for example, like the EP deco label on solar panels um, gives more point if you kind of design for recycling, but also if you're, uh, you're using like recycled materials and so on. So you can do that. You can also have some solar waste policy, both at the state and federal level. Increasing the cost of landfilling would be a good thing in particular for Michigan. It's one of the lowest place. So uh, like it's really difficult for to make the case for recycling if you're gonna pay 10 times more than you would for landfilling in particular if you're uh, putting material that is not really sparse in the landfill and not toxic. So um, that would be uh, better if they would not end there, uh, there. So we need also to just invest more in the research recycling industry and create a new industry for PV. Can I go quick? I know it's been quite a time and I've been talking for a long time. I didn't think I had that much to say, but it's taking a little bit more time than I thought. But um, just a few things about toxicity because I get a lot of questions about that. So 
uh, and all TCL, the main test is called like this TCLP and it tests mostly for, for lead. So all sort of modules, they have to pass the TCLP. And usually if it's, uh, if it passed that, then it's safe for putting in a like, general landfill. So, uh, and also in terms of like recycling, if uh, recyclers usually don't accept modules that would have failed the TCLP, uh, and, but otherwise they, they are okay with recycling it, whether they are like electric waste recycler or recycler that focus on um, solar materials. There's a standard about like how you do that because uh, solar modules all look different and depending on like where you take your samples, you're gonna get different results. Um, that's a lot of what my research is about. Like we, I don't make solar panels anymore, but I destroy them. So, and I do different type of bleaching and put them, I actually digest them. So I put them in liquid form to see exactly what's in them. And then I do different uh, landfill, different uh, testing to see how they would, like what would leach in the worst case scenario and so on. I did, I mentioned that before, I did a lot of tests uh, with like hotter uh, product and so on. And usually a lot of the other, thing you can buy on like eBay or Amazon would be more toxic. A lot of the like cheap flashlight battery or uh, different things uh, or phone replacement battery I got like on Amazon were pretty toxic. So a lot of uh, Raycom and electronic products are uh, way more hazardous than most solar panels. So that's more result from EPRI. They got similar, they've done more, have done, I don't know, maybe like eight modules uh, recently they've done 33 and they only got like three that failed the TCLP and they, it was all due to like um, that. So I would say like the most majority of uh, solar panels are not toxic at all. Uh, we're doing more work on like other aspect of uh, toxicity. So like PFAS and it's not just like bad teaching study. I do like acute toxicity by actually last week at the conference, we presented uh, some work from um, a student that looks at like what is the like which components would be toxic in the solar panels and where she got the most toxicity is not the module itself a lot of time it's from the junction box or some of the other uh, cables that are in like in common electronic products so the solar module itself uh, usually is not toxic it's pretty um, stable and not really complicated materials because anything you add in the solar modules will not make it as good so, uh, but one aspect of that is if you're worried about toxicity, then putting a regulation that requires like recycling, kind of uh, get rid of that issue. Because if it doesn't go into the landfill, then it's not gonna leach anything for sure. So uh, this is better even than putting in the landfill, even though they're not toxic. So let me be clear, I don't want solar panels to end up in the landfill, but they're not toxic if they were gonna end up there. But it would be much better from uh, for a lot of different aspects in terms of like resource uh, supply chain and so on to have more circularity in the solar industry. And that's just what I just said. Um, we retire solar panels uh, sooner than the thirty-year lifetime right now for economic and failure reason. Uh, in particular, in the Midwest region, uh, region I think we're going to start seeing more retirement in the next five years. So now it's the time to start thinking about. Do we want policy for end of life? Do you want to um, do something about it? Uh, do we want to build like an industry that will take advantage of this material or we're okay with like larger players like solar cycle or other company to move into Michigan and uh, take over kind of the recycling. Um, but it is a, still a challenging uh, area due to the cost of the new modules if you want to do like second life. Um, but uh, if we address the waste concern right now, we it will help with the public trust and improve the success of the PV uh, overall. And that's all, <laughs> that was a real long presentation. So hopefully there's not too much question, but uh, thank you. And if there is more question on anything I presented today or uh, any other discussion you wanna have, I put my email address there. And sometimes it takes me a little bit of time, but I usually always answer email I end up getting. So thank you. You're muted, so I cannot hear you. John, you're muted. I'm muted, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we have time for a few questions. So uh, uh, who has a question? I have a question, if you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that 
uh, I was thinking about during your presentation is th the whole secondary or tertiary market of uh, solar and batteries is something that between the universities and community colleges and labor unions and the state of Michigan, I mean, there's a whole business model about second life uh, uses for solar panels and including one thing that I've been interested in, which is, you know, a lot of solar installations in Michigan didn't include batteries because of where the state of battery technology is. But as ba batteries come online, it would seem that it might be useful to replace the, you know, the th like the typical 300 watt solar panel with a six or seven or higher watt solar panel and then take those previous those used solar panels and maybe donate them for community solar or some other purpose if they're perfectly good 300 watt solar panels you know find another market for them so that people who uh want solar but have a problem with the entry price level could use it but it seems like there's a whole business model that the university systems um could use to develop new markets for all all of these things that you talked about tonight i guess that's about it so yeah well I, maybe the university but um uh, i think other um diane has as her end up i know that's where she has uh, she, that's what she's doing and i know like uh john kinch also i uh, was working in in this area i think it doesn't necessarily matter who it is but you're right there is um there is value in those modules and the number you said like 300 watt is pretty much what we consider or most people consider kind of the lower point i think 250 would be okay but not like lower uh, capacity modules that people will say well this is old technology i don't want it or it's not really worth it but if you're not like land limited um, like not on a roof you and for certain application like you don't need to have huge amount of electricity so a lot of those uh, community or um, like project for example that rich is doing in colorado uh, yeah, with battery, then it makes sense. Like, maybe if you can have the solar panels for half the price, which is usually what people are willing to pay for, um, then it reduces considerably like the price of your system. So, go ahead, yeah. Diane. Hi, everybody. Yes, Philip, that's what we're working on here in Detroit. <laughs> and we're actually looking at a couple of big federal grant proposals right now. Um, I don't know, Nikki, if you're looking at those as well, um, but um, we're looking at um, that pilot. One of our biggest problems is getting access to the recycled panels. So here in Michigan, what we'll be probably doing soon is reaching out to a lot of the solar installers that are doing that repowering to see what system we can put in place, and this may be a role with um, GLREA as well, is helping to track our panels coming down as new panels are going up and where are they going? And is there a community use for them? So um, we're finding that in Detroit with all the urban farmers, there's actually high interest for them. A 10 year, 15 year life cycle is actually pretty good if you've got an urban farm and you would just want something to pump water um, and provide a little bit of electricity um, out on site rather than bring in power. So the time is right for us to start developing some programs for that. And that's what we're doing. So yes, I really appreciated your talk and I, I really enjoyed it when we were on the panel together. And I think we should do a project like this in Detroit, don't you? Yeah, no, I would be happy to <laughs> discuss more. And I, I'm not sure exactly for what you're applying for. There's been quite a bit of different calls. So it's a little bit hard to <laughs> keep track of everything. But I don't I don't I don't have anything uh on that specific uh area. But I think it's really I think right now a lot of the big installer are also like signing contract with those like for example with solar cycle or doing uh uh things like that. So I think it's a good time right now to start talking about uh two installers and have a plan uh for that. Uh, in because it, it will make more sense if it doesn't travel over like a thousand miles to go to a new location be better that if you take something out like i don't know around like msu campus that you put it in like 20 miles 50 miles from where you took it down like the keep cost of the shipping yeah right. you need to keep it local to make it um and what you mentioned about like the urban farming is one thing a lot of the work we do 
like it's in farming in general, like irrigation, that's a good place for putting new solar panels. Like it's a seasonal application and you don't need like huge amount of uh, power. So, and usually when you need irrigation is when it's sunny, <laughs> when it's raining, you don't need it anyway. So it's a pretty good match. So some of the other work I'm doing is kind of matching the uh, like what level or how much, uh, yeah, this kind of repowering, what would be the need and what good application would there be? So, and I, also because of the, but I think there needs to be some uh, regulation or kind of a better understanding about like how to test uh, reuse modules that happen. Uh, because if you look in like other country that are a bit more advanced, like France right now is pushing back against a lot of the second use of solar panels because they because of the concern that you might be taking a panel and putting it back somewhere else and then cause like a fire because it was damaged and you didn't test it properly. So like they are kind of uh, not, I wouldn't call it like a ban, but uh, a lot of pushback against uh, second use because they are moving too fast without establishing good standards and methods for ensuring like that they are safe. Because if you think about like new module, because before it's so, like sold to you, they have to go through pretty uh, strict protocol of like testing and making sure uh, modules are up to a certain standard, right? So like quality control. So we, we need to have certain quality control before we do some of the reuse application. So good point. Go ahead, John. Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, first of all, I wanna thank you very much for your presentation. It was obviously very detailed, very in depth and you really provided a lot of information. I had two reactions though, as I'm sitting through this. One is the classic law of externalities, where once a homeowner, you know, gets rid of old solar panels, they probably forget about it because they assume it's someone else's problem and someone else is going to have to pay for for just for transporting a used solar panel, paying the cost of putting it into a landfill or paying for the cost of transporting it to a recycling firm that can then get the value out of it. And then the second thought I had was the bottle bill in Michigan. When I was a kid, there were obviously tons of pop bottles and tin cans everywhere, and nobody dealt with them be, until we put a deposit on the bottles. And then all of a sudden, the consumers that are drinking the Coca-Cola, they have to pay. And so then there's an incentive, an economic incentive, to return the pop cans to the grocery stores. And you set up this whole chain where you can actually recycle the, you know, the pop bottles. And so my thinking is, and maybe you've already thought of this, I don't pretend to be by any means, you know, a genius by any means, but as the cost of solar panels come down, maybe you could, we could pass a law to tack on an extra 50 bucks or something that will help pay to transport the solar panel back to a solar recycling firm. And therefore it reduces the cost of them to actually getting the recycled material. So then their, their ability to create a, a profit making company or even a nonprofit able to make their budget is, is reduced by the fact that the consumer or the utility who's buying the panels and now wants them recycled, they're paying a cost to as a part as a part of when they first purchased the panel, that then they could, you know, the the panel essentially is there's a built-in uh, money available to transport that panel back to the recycling firm. So I'll just stop there and ask for a quick reaction. Yeah, I agree with you. I'm originally, I like bottle bills. So I'm originally Canadian from Quebec and we have like bottle bills on everything. And it's also working really well. Like it usually creates a really high percentage recycling rate. It's the same thing in the US. Like what is the most recycled product is your lead acid battery in your car and you have like a deposit on it. So like every time we have a deposit like that, it, it really helps creating uh, kind of a close, uh, close loop. Um, and Enriel did a study on that. Uh, so Garvin did kind of this analysis and looking at how much it would be and how much it would help the recycling in the second life uh, market. I would say like $50 would be too much for, for panel probably. Um, and I think it needs to maybe like $10 would, would be more of an acceptable uh, price. But even like if it didn't meet the whole thing, people 
people don't like to lose money. So that would probably help. Uh, even if you had like five or $10, people will say, well, like if I have 20 modules on my house, like it's worth it because I'm going to get like more than like $200. So it's, it's worth, like it's, it's worth it than to the trouble. So yeah, I think, I think that's a good idea, but this is also like an area where people are really opposed to like bottle bills in general, uh, just in the U S well, so. I, <laughs> well, we should be careful here. The, so the soft drink association opposes them, but it's always I me. Mean, the bottle bill in Michigan got enacted by a ballot initiative and it passed overwhelmingly. So, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's the direction it needs to go. Um, I don't know, but right now I don't, I haven't looked if what state is doing what uh, I think, I think their concern is also like how much would that stay within the same state if you don't have company that can recycle it. Like, for example, if we put it in Michigan, but we don't have an actual recycler, they just take the thing. Like, like right now, even like some of the other work with every uh, that we're doing regarding recycling is just trying to figure out which one are good recyclers and who are not real recyclers because it's not clear right now. So because if someone just takes and uh, take the frame out and shrink the rest and put it to landfill. It's not a real recycler. So those are the one that says like it's ten dollar per module. Like a real recycler is more expensive. So you want to make sure that if you have this bottle bill, I want it to um, go after to benefit like recyclers that actually do the extra work to get the silicon out or get uh, like all the materials uh, out of the solar panels, not just the easy stuff out. So. But I think it would have to, like, if you want to do that, it would need, like, unless we have a recycler that can do all of that in every single state, or, like, I, I think that would that will happen probably, like, in California, mostly also because they have so much distributed solar from residential that, like, in order to get that recycle versus landfill, they'll need to have uh, more of a central system. But, um, yeah, it hasn't happened yet, but it needs to be discussed or that would be I would think that would be a very good solution for it. Well I want to leave you with one final thought. I Diane mentioned that GLREA could be potentially be helpful in some ways. I think this is just a suggestion of course that as a part of your research maybe you could get some of your students to work with you to come up with some practical ideas on how we could pass legislation in Michigan to actually set up a system that creates a recycling market within Michigan. Because just as you indicated that Michigan passed a lot of innovative laws last November, I think that mm -hmm. that's an indication that we want to be far thinking in terms of uh, promoting solar, but with the recognition that we have an environmental responsibility to take care of the end of life as well. And so I think the legislature will be open to ideas, but we just have to have someone like you go through all this research and actually figure out what is potentially politically possible that would be effective in terms of creating a market for recycling. Okay, I'll think about it. <laughs> no, I think that's a good idea. And um, yeah, I, I'm part of the environmental science and policy program. So I do also advise in, uh, in terms of policy. I'm more comfortable with the engineering part, but that's a, that's a really good suggestion. And I think from a material point of view, it makes sense for uh, Michigan too. Like we produce silicon. We have a lot of manufacturers for like battery manufacturing coming in, a lot of other research. So that'd be good to be able to produce uh, like new materials that can go back into the other industry we're trying to like to grow. So. It helps the supply chain. So, well, Nick, thank you. Yeah, well, we're, we're at uh, eight thirteen, so we need to wrap up. But, Nick, gee, thank you very much for this presentation. A lot of good information, and I'm glad we're going to have a recording that'll be on our YouTube channel for people who want to check it out. And I think you know it'd probably be uh, useful if you come back in about a year and kind of give us a status report because it sounds like uh, things might be rapidly changing here, uh, and a lot of hopefully. Uh, we're going to make some good progress over the next year or so. So thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward to uh, seeing you again. Take care.